you know, oh, well, I can only do gigs on Saturdays and Sundays, right? Well, I think that right there, what you just said is a huge component and a huge mental roadblock for a lot of people. And it's the excuse of, I don't have the time. And I'm calling it an excuse because it's an excuse. It's not to sound harsh. Love you guys. Um, and, and this would apply to anybody that says like, you know, it's, it's hard to find the time. Well, okay, let's just say you've got your full-time job right? Or you're, you're a full-time student, whatever you are full-time that prevents you from having this time. What's the excuse for all the other people who aren't saying that? Mm. What about the people that you're following, the entrepreneur accounts, the young kid that's killing it, that you are following and watching and you quote unquote aspire to be like, what is the difference? We all got the same 24 hours, right? So if that's true, we all believe that we have the same 24 hours. The only difference is that you're making the excuse that you don't have the time. Welcome back to another episode of the Rough Cut Club. I am your host, Joey Nicotra, here today, unfortunately, without my amazing co-host, Mr. Shane Wright-Zammer. Shane had some other business that he had to attend to, but today, I am kicking it in the studio with someone who I go way, way, way back with, back, back in the day style. Way back. Way back in the day. Uh, we have a very, very special guest, my friend. But not only that, you may have seen him rolling with Soldier Boy back in the day, or you might have seen him if you really go back playing baseball in the in the field in the diamond. He's also the founder of BHF Marketing Management Management and Consulting. But my favorite accolade that I cannot fail to mention is my old former tour bus driver, Mr. White. T Taylor Leach in the building. What's up, brother? What is up, my guy? Just want to make a quick correction. I was not driving the tour bus. D were you I not was driving? facilitating the tour bus. We I had a guy named like... Gentry that was driving the tour bus. Okay, that's us. fair. That's fair. I feel like I was in keeping my you guys in check. You were driving, but yeah. he was the tour bus facilitator. There yeah. we go. I love it, man. Yeah. Well, dog, thank you so much for coming into the studio today, bro. You are our latest and greatest VIP Rough Cut Club member. Love it. And uh, man, for those that don't know you. Just what exactly are you doing in the industry today? Man, uh, so my business, you know, once going independent, it became marketing management and consulting. So when people ask me, what do you do? The quick one-liner, marketing management and consulting with a strong emphasis on media production. You know, anything from photo film to 3D animation productions. Uh, so that's kind of like the, the most basic way I could say it. Yeah, that's super awesome, man. Yeah, uh, for those that don't know T... Obviously, you and I go way back. I think I did the math, and I think it's 13 years, which is pretty insane. Yeah, I think you were like, what, 14 or something uh, like yeah, that? Yeah, I was like, I think I had just turned 15 okay. and uh, was definitely probably more of a nuisance than a friend <laughs> yeah. at the time. Wearing really large t-shirts. Really large, oversized <laughs> clothes. But that was the style back in the day, dude. Sure. But uh, <laughs> he says, sure. Uh, but anyway, um, man- when I met you at that time, like that wasn't the identity. And I, I mean, part of it was wrapped into that. Um, but there was like the video side for you came much later. Yeah, in a sense. I mean, I, I grew up with a camera in my hands. Just yeah. my mom was being a, a photographer my whole life. You know, my dad, computer programmer. So between the two of them, I was always around, you know, media or website design, graphic design. Like that was kind of stuff I was always doing probably since I was like 10 years old. But in terms of from a professional standpoint and integrating that into, you know, business and, and what I was doing when you met me, it definitely came a little bit later within, you know, that company and the existence of it. Love it, man. Well, a lot of times when I think about T, mm -hmm. I think about, you know, back in the day you were rolling with, you know, honestly, more celebrities at that time <laughs> than I could even keep, keep tabs with. Yeah. And, uh, like, Give me a little bit of a backstory in terms of like what you were doing to like set up what you were doing now. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a weird story. I mean, the whole thing feels like a weird, uh, made up story almost, but you know, I was working for a fashion brand at the time, a streetwear clothing headwear brand. Uh, and I was the head of marketing for the company. Part of that was just figuring out how to get, you know, product hats uh onto 
you know, the tastemakers, right? Like the, the notable people, the athletes, the artists, DJs, um, anybody that, you know, was cool, right? The common thread was cool. Uh, and so trying to do that is just, where do you start, right? Well, we would go to these events, you know, at the time I wasn't the head of marketing. I was rolling with the guy that was, I'm carrying boxes, doing stuff that's like not the fun stuff, you know, and, and, you know, while he'd be off, you know, trying to connect with the management of the artist or the, the DJ or whoever I'm sitting there like, I should probably just go try to connect with the artist. Like, let's just go direct. I'm going to try to meet that guy. And so I would just go do my thing, like just be me. Right. Which is, that sounds probably cliche or stereotypical, but just the idea of I'm just going to go be me, try to be different than everyone else in terms of like not treating them like they're something special, like not disrespectful, but just, you know, like you're a regular person. So we'd be at, be at music video shoots. We'd be at these different events. And a lot of times at that particular time, it was very hip hop heavy, rap heavy. I'm in Atlanta all the time. I'm in these different, you know, places like music video shoots where like I'm the one guy sticking out like a sore thumb, like who's, the, <laughs> who's this dude? Um, and that was really it, man. I just would get in the mix with these people. And I think the thing that was appealing to me being there for them was like, oh, this guy isn't the guy that's trying to be a fan right now or freaking out about being here right now. He's just chilling. I'm going to go up to you and be like, hey, you want to go grab a bite? You know, you want to go grab a drink? Like, you know, the same thing I would say to my friends or anybody else that, you know, isn't this notable person. Um, and so that became a thing. Um, you know, it's one of those things like once you get into a circle of people, like people start, you know, those notable people start seeing you around other notable people. It's kind of almost this like unspoken cosign, right? Like, oh, you're, he's cool with this person. So he must be cool. So it's probably safe for me to be cool with him too. Right. And early on, you know, I guess to kind of like bring this all the way back around to now, I would say one of my biggest skill sets way beyond, you know, any other creative stuff, the marketing, you know, activities, um, business, you know, expertise or anything like that is my ability to build relationships with people. I think the ability to build relationships with people, it's kind of like I've said it before. I hate the word networking. People, people overuse it. You, you, you go to a, a restaurant or a bar and you're there and you talk to people and people say they're networking. It's like, well, kind of, but it's really relationship building. Relationship building is really what it is. Um, and so I feel like that skill set is what's enabled me to do anything that I've done over the last, you know, call it um, 18 years or so, right? From a career standpoint. And everything is a byproduct of that. You know, even being put in positions where I get to do some stuff that maybe I'm not even fully qualified for at the time, right? And uh, so I know I kind of long-windedly answered your question there, but that's kind of the idea is like back then, getting cool with those people, it took me a minute to realize what I was doing, but about six months into kind of being around those types of folks is when I picked up on, oh, if I really focus on relationship building, then I can actually uh, kind of take this wherever I want to go with it. You know, it's like the wrapping, the, you know, all the different things that I got to participate in that you're, you're familiar with, and we can talk about more of, but I believe it's all an extension of that skill set. Yeah, man, dude, that's so good. I when I was thinking about doing this episode, I I was thinking about like at the heart of video is marketing, mm. right? Like every every time that we as filmmakers make a video, the goal of that is either to market it so that we can spread a message, or it is helping another company market something, yeah. and that is the marketing, right? Um, and I was like, man, there's like you have such a crazy background in doing marketing that's so much more unique than I feel like other people approach, you know, the the standpoint of video from. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the relationships thing, but what do you feel like your, or, or let me rephrase the question, how do you feel like your background in marketing that you came from, you know, being in the lifestyle mm. fashion brand in that space has impacted and influenced the way that you create videos now today. Man, I think it's it's a huge upper hand for me when I work with, uh, you know, companies, businesses, uh, 
individuals, sports teams, really, really whoever it is, typically when they're hiring someone to come in and shoot video, photo, or some sort of production for them, right? They're looking at them as only that thing, meaning, uh, oh, this is, you'll hear people say, oh, this is our video guy, right? Or this is our photo guy, you know, which nothing wrong with that title or distinction, right? But when I come in, because I've sat on the other side of the table, because I've been the guy that's hired out the video guy, hired out the photo guy or the production team, you know, uh, for a brand, for a company, mul multiple companies, you know, working with, uh, you know, all, all types of household names. I'm, I've sat in that seat, right? So now I'm thinking that way on, on the other end of it. So when I'm, I'm dealing with a company, it's like, I get to bring elements to the conversation that are really more from a business perspective. Like, hey, okay, here's the video or the production side of things. But the reason that I'm thinking we should do it like this is because I'm thinking from the business side of things and how this is going to benefit you guys. Here's some other dots that we can connect um, that plays in that probably more better way to say it, business strategy. That's really where the consulting comes in, in right. terms of like how you've set your business up. Sure. I mean, on the consulting side, I mean, there's times where on the consulting side, I'm not talking about anything related to production at all. It's just yeah. straight up business consulting or marketing consulting, right? Um, I mean, marketing is such a big word. I almost kind of like hate that word too, <laughs> because it's, it's something where someone goes, oh, I'm in marketing. Well, what does that mean? I mean, if we're talking about a marketing department for, you know, let's just say some big company or, or brand and they have a department of marketing, right? That means they're going to have uh, digital marketing, right? They're going to have someone, a group or someone that's responsible for the SEO marketing on the digital side, right? Keywords and Google search and all that kind of stuff. They're going to have social marketing, right? They're going to have someone that's only handling the social media. They're going to have uh, sales marketing, right? Which is going to be everything from your in-store, you know, point of purchase visuals, posters inside of some retail store that you're selling into, or maybe visuals that are only being used by the sales team so that they can go show those visuals, whether it be line sheets or just cool hype pieces to show uh, buyers at retail stores to get them to want to purchase the product and put it in the retail store. And, and then you know, my personal favorite, and I think the thing, because I, I can play in all those, but the one that I love the most that kind of ties really into the the production side of things is experiential marketing, right? So experiential marketing is where you're creating an experience, whether that's an event, some sort of in-store activation, that's some sort of, um, you know, project that you do like, you know, at a music festival or something with a brand and trying to get them uh, some attention while they're there. Um, that can look like so many different things, but the experiential marketing to me is what has the most impact on people. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, something Shane and I have talked about on this show before is like, you can make a really incredible video for somebody, but at the end of the day, we need to provide ROI for the mm -hmm. clients that we're serving. Yeah. And bringing that marketing mentality and background to the clients that you're actually helping instead of just like, you know, the visuals that you're going to make, but like what is ultimately going to move the needle in terms of like, we have to think like marketers when we're doing our job. Right. Well, I, I think it's a disservice that a lot of, um, and maybe not intentionally, right, but a lot of people in positions to create content for companies, you know we know that we can do our side of it, right? We know we can produce the content and give you exactly what you're looking for. A question I always ask potential clients is, you know, if it's, if it's a content production situation, hey, I know I can execute this, but once it's executed, what's your game plan? What are you going to do with it? How are you going to distribute this? Because it really, and, and some people would look at it like, man, don't talk yourself out of the business. Well, I don't want to do everything perfectly, execute perfectly, and then them feel like, oh, that was a waste of money. Nobody saw it. Well, what was your game plan for people to see it? What was your distribution plan? Have you thought about a distribution budget beyond the budget that you're thinking about for production? And when you have that conversation with the client, there's been times where that has the business has not happened because of that. But I would rather that be your experience with me where I'm saving you money instead of wasting money because I'm telling you like, hey, man, you might want to wait on doing this with me right now. Or 
go somewhere else, spend a little less money on the content production, and then allocate some of what you were going to spend with me towards distribution, because it doesn't mean anything if no one sees it. A hundred percent, dude. Shame, like, especially now in the age of like social content, where like all these ads are going to social, it's the easiest place to mess up the distro. And like, you know, if you're if you're making like some web uh, a video that's going to live on a website or something and and they throw it up there like that, that's almost like a banner piece, like the right. distro on that is less critical than if you're rolling out like a massive, you know, commercial either on broadcast, either on social, if you're running ad campaigns for it, like all of yeah. the stuff that goes into the marketing side of the filmmaking, if you mess up the distro to your point, it doesn't matter how good the video is. Yeah. The distro actually has to come first. hundred percent. That, that should really be the first thought. I mean, beyond maybe like the initial campaign idea, your initial thought should be the rollout strategy. How do we roll this out? How do we get this in front of as many people as possible? You know, and, and I even with that on that topic, I, I go back and forth, you know, like going back to the experiential marketing component, right? There's this, there's this kind of thing I'll say where when I'm, when talking to people about that, like what's going to have the most impact, you know, people are always talking about views, right? Views and clicks. Well, I understand that. And I agree to an extent, but you know, where I've seen the most impact is the one-on-one -on -one or small personal marketing. Um, and, and so this isn't to negate, I think you need a mix of all of these things, mass marketing. And like, here's the example I'll use is, I always tell people like, hey, here's the deal. I would rather take the time, energy, and effort that it's gonna require for me to talk to, you know, a million people, right? We'll just use that as an extreme example, a million people one-on-one, -on -one, right? And have this interpersonal interaction with them, the guy from the brand or the, the, the point of contact, the face of the brand, whatever it may be, um, with the potential fan, with the potential audience member, then throwing up a billboard on a highway that a million people will drive by in a weekend, mm. right? Because the impact of that interpersonal uh, connection where, you know, they're going to get to go back and tell their friend, dude, I got to meet the guy. Like he's with the company, you know, it's not just like some promo model they had. It's like, no, dude, he's the dude from the company. He hooked me up with a hat. He hooked me up with a sticker. He hooked me up with a whatever. We talked, we took a picture. That word of mouth right there has so much more value than, I mean, I, I drove by probably 50 billboards to get here today. I couldn't tell you one of them that I saw. And a lot of other people did too, but the value is so much greater. It's just the effort is also so much greater, right? But people are always thinking from a views standpoint, which in the visual content world, views is important, but what does that actually translate into? And I've just seen from personal experience when I'm doing an event, like an in-store event where I've got a DJ at a, you know, a lid store in the mall or, you know, promo models, the experience of people getting to talk to the guy, interact with, and I'm not trying to hype me up, but just in that context, that idea that goes so much further. That's how you actually create a fan of something, right? It's not just them seeing it over and over and over again, right? It, maybe if you're like a, a product that doesn't have like, you know, fandom associated with it, but from an, if you're building an audience standpoint, they want to connect with you. They want that behind the scenes, personal, I get to go talk about it with my friends because it's a cool story, you know, scenario versus like, oh, I drove by and there was this cool visual on the side of the highway. So for the filmmaker listening on the other end of this, how would you apply that model to how they mm. can weave that into how they're running their their freelance world or their production company or whatever it is? Yeah, so it's kind of tough because like in that world, right, you've kind of got two audiences, right? You have one audience, which is, your clientele or pot potential clientele, which that's where the money is going to come from. Right. You know, and it depends on what you're doing. Are you making films? Right. And like you have an, a captive audience watching the end product that becomes like a, oh man, I love JJ Abrams films because he does this and that. Or are you someone producing content for companies? Right. I mean, it's, it's kind of twofold, but I think one way that you could get into that is, you know, Peeking, let, let people peek behind the curtain, right? Behind the scenes content, right? The 
uh, you know, kind of like back in the day, like at the end of the DVD, you could watch like the director commentary. Oh, that was you the know, best, like dude. after the movie was yes. over, like you could go to the menu and it's like you can watch it again and hear the directors and some of the other people yes. behind the scenes, like they got to bring talking about it and telling you so. Oh man, when we were filming this scene, this was so funny because this happened, and you're getting this inside, you know, baseball on something you really just enjoyed watching or you know back to the behind the scenes content i love seeing that stuff right and i think that's huge for clients because a lot of times they just see the end product but you know i'm sure you've talked about it a million times there's also the you know the effect of going well this is what it looked like to get to that right mm -hmm. and they see the lights camera action they see the crew they see all those different components and that peek behind the curtain uh create some opportunity for that. I think it's probably a little bit tougher to translate the experiential marketing component on this side of things. Cause you know, you guys aren't throwing events, you know, and, and the, I mean, I know you guys have done events, but in the same sense of like, uh, it, it'd be like trying to do like an in-store event that was based around like a production. Here's an in-production event. Like we're doing a production. We're going to let people come in and hang out, you know, experience it right which that's kind of like a cool idea if you yeah. pull that off but um it might not translate as well but i think the overall idea though is how can you be as personal as possible with people let them peek behind the curtain give them some insight don't just be a service right be more of like a uh let them into your world right let them know who you are as a person um i think that's probably why you guys are doing this podcast a big part of it right it's not just a talk right there's probably the the benefit of sharing you know valuable insight and information totally. from creatives and business people but then also uh your potential clientele yeah. is getting to see you guys yeah. from a whole different perspective and it it's placing you in a position of uh expertise and authority yep. on yep. The, the subject matter um so all those things kind of go hand in hand. So, hey, here's a great example right here. Um, get in front of the camera. Probably probably one of the best things. I love it, man. Get in front of the camera. The the value in building a personal brand now nowadays, like even if you're not going to be mm -hmm. like, even if the goal isn't like to become some influencer, right? Like even, even here, like my goal isn't to become some right. filmmaking influencer. But I think that giving people just that that connection to you like it's it's credibility like if i go online and i see someone who's always in front of the camera yeah like i'm gonna feel like i can grab onto this person and they're a real person even if they're not some famous you know whatever it's like this is a real human being that i can connect to and and again it puts you in a in a position to where somebody down the road may think of that and, you know, I may be the guy that comes to mind when, when, when the job opportunity comes right. around. Well, um, well, even to that point, I mean, what I'm saying, you want to, you want to put yourself in a position where you're speaking from a, a place of authority or expertise. I don't, I don't care if we're talking about production or we're talking about anything else. You're an interior decorator, <laughs> you know, like yeah. people want to hire the best when they're spending money. They want to know that. I picked the best person for the job. Well, how is someone going to know that you're the best person for the job? Well, there's going to be the proof in your work, mm -hmm. right? The actual product or the service that you provide, right? Your portfolio. Um, but then beyond that, how do they figure it out even further? How do they get more confidence that you're the right person? Well, when they're talking with you, when you're, when you're, telling them about the process. Well, hey, when you work with me, this is what it's going to be like. This is how we approach the situation. This is uh, what production day looks like. You know, all those, you know, different things that you are sharing with them, the inside or the insight that you're sharing with them, uh, that goes a long way in building their confidence in you. Like, I don't, I don't want to hire the guy or the girl that is just, uh, I think, you know, she's, she's, knows what she's talking about. Like, I want to know, right? Yeah. So when you're doing something like a podcast, you're bringing these people on. When I say positioning, I'm talking about in front of your audience, in front of people who are watching going, man, you know what? Through the consistency of seeing them constantly bringing on other experts, hearing how Joey or Shane are approaching their production, the back and forth between these different creatives, 
this is the other proof beyond the visual proof. This is the other proof that I need to feel like this is a good place to spend my money and I'm going to get out of it what I want because you don't know if you're going to get out of it what you want until you see that finished product. And that's either where excitement or disappointment, the meeting or the not meeting of expectations happens. I love it, dude. Well, before we jump off this, I want to I want to come back to the relationship building piece yeah. because you said that's like the thing that you do best. And obviously, like when you're in the freelance game or or whatever, like in order to 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 keep eating, you have to build relationships yeah. and get work coming through. And so talk to me about like how you approach building relationships with people, especially clients and uh, people it, within the industry as well that you feel like might be uh, just like a unique take on how other people would approach mm. building relationships. Yeah, man. I, th I think a big thing is asking questions. People love to talk about themselves, bro. You you're, you're asking all the questions to me right here. I like to talk, you know, you know me, I'm a talker, yeah. right? Um, and it's not so much about stroking the ego or anything like that, but you know, I think the best way to really build a relationship with somebody is to make them feel, and it's not like you don't actually feel this way, but make them feel like you care, right? Because a lot of people will come in and talk about me, 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 this is what I'm doing, look how great I am, and and maybe not even with the intention of coming off that way, right? But uh, I feel like you can really hold people's attention when they're the ones speaking. People, people also love to teach. Right. Like if, whether they know it or not, people love to be the person that gets to show somebody how to do something right or bring insight. So when I'm with people, it really doesn't matter who it is. I focus mostly on trying to ask more questions than I am doing, like the talking or the sharing. Now, on the flip side of that, they show me that they want to know more about me when they start asking me questions. So now it becomes kind of this back and forth where that I mean, that's really how you get to know somebody. Right. So. If, if you want to build a relationship, what is building a relationship? Getting to know someone, right? And to get to know someone, what does that mean? You have to find out things about them. So the only way to find out things about them without just sitting there crossing your fingers and hoping they share all the right information is you ask the things that yeah. you want to know. I was, I was listening to a story one time and just like paraphrasing and putting it together, this, these two guys were sitting on an airplane together. And, you know, normally I don't, I don't chop it up with, uh, mm. the guy sitting next You're to that me. Guy. I'm the guy headphones that's like in. headphones <laughs> in, like that, that's how I roll. But in this case, the other person who was telling the story, they were, uh, the guy next to them was a small talker and, mm. and, uh, Basically, how it wound up going is one person was asking the other person's questions the entire flight. And when they got done, the person that had been talking and answering the questions the whole time was like, wow, that guy was just like the coolest dude. Exactly. He knew he knew nothing about him. But because of the intent behind the guy asking questions, he made him feel like he was so interesting yeah. and connected to the guy, right. even though that guy didn't know anything about the guy asking questions. Yeah. You know, something I kind of call it is you're building social equity yeah. with somebody yeah. and uh, the they feel like you're invested in them. Right. And uh, it's, it's kind of like the thing, like, how do you like, so let's take it to a personal level. Uh, people love, like, let's just say someone has kids, right. And like, you get their kids names through that conversation next time you're talking to him oh hey how's jack doing how's your kid doing like how, how'd their baseball tournament go that you were telling me about when people feel man you remember that like even even down to like something as basic as remembering someone's name yeah i mean i I'm, I'm guilty of that i try to do so good at it but it's just tough you know when you when you meet so many people over so many years it's like you can only be so good at it. You only have so much room up in your brain, but I, I know I've been impacted by people where they remember my name and I'm just like, I would never have expected you to remember my name. And it makes you feel special. I've had clients that I work for where, you know, I've told them like, Oh, I'm going on, you know, this vacation, like two weeks after we shoot or, or something like that. And we won't see each other for like three months. Yeah. But then after three months they are like, how was that trip? Right. And it's like, dang dude, yeah. like, it's small too. It's 100%. nothing major, but it's like, okay, cool. This person cares about me beyond what I do for them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I mean, dude, that is huge in terms of like just 
continuing to grow your network so that you can grow your career and whatever you're doing. Right. So, man, I love that, dude. You put out a uh, you put out an article a while back um, that said I quit my job yeah. of 12 years to go and work for myself. Something yeah, like turn, turn 30, quit my job of yeah, 12 years. Yeah, I turned 30 yeah. and quit my job of 12 years, man. Dive into um, a little bit about that article because I think it was a really impactful piece for a lot of people. Um, so I just want to hear like from you, you know, what, what, what that was like. Yeah. You know, that was really a piece to kind of, you know, when I did, I was with that company for, I think it was actually closer to probably 13, almost 14 years, somewhere, right. somewhere in that range. And, uh, you know, when I quit, I just went head down. I didn't make some big announcement about it. You know, like I had a lot of identity associated with that, that brand and that company. Um, and I didn't want to make some like spectacle of it, you know, couple of reasons. Uh, one being, you know, if I fail <laughs> at this endeavor, I don't want to have kicked it off by going like, Hey, look at me and how great I am and I'm what I'm about to go do. And then six months later flop. Right. And kind of look like an idiot, um, at that point. And so, uh, and then on the other side of it was just, I want to really focus in on this mission, you know, that I'm on. And so after, I think it was maybe a year later, uh, or so, I'm confident in what I'm doing in my business. I've already had a successful year in doing it. There's no turning back at this point. I know I'm not failing. And I was like, well, I also know that there's a lot of people because I would still get the questions that think I still am doing my old job, right? And so it was kind of almost like a press release almost in a way, but through a article that I put out on LinkedIn, which for the record, I don't even, use, that's the one time I've used LinkedIn, but I felt like it was a good place to put it. Um, but it was really, you know, I'm calling it a press release, but it was kind of disguised as a insightful article on anybody that might be in this position that I was in. Here's how I approached it. Here's how, you know, and, and you and I were kind of talking about it before. There's a lot of people, especially in this industry, who photography, videography, some sort of creative uh, thing that they do right now is a side hustle, right? Or it's it's not the main thing. And how do I make it the main thing? Um, and I think there's a lot that that goes into that. So you, you want me to kind of dive into that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Okay. So uh, I'll try to remember the article, but the, the gist of it was, you know, for me, I was the kind of the face of this brand um, in a way that was not just like my own self-proclamation, but just kind of what ended up, you know, happening internally, you know, uh, referenced that way often. And with that, right, this is a public facing brand. It's a it's a streetwear fashion, you know, company. I'm at all the events. I'm the person getting the product onto the celebrities, the artists, the athletes. I'm the one putting on the events. I'm a point person for uh, you were uh, the guy, bro. <laughs> yeah. And not, it's, guy. Not, it's not a brag, but it's just like the reality of it is, is I'm, I'm a, a, a component, a common thread in a lot of the public facing stuff that the fan base saw, or even behind the scenes, the interactions with partners of ours, business partners or, um, collaborative partners. You were the um, glue, bro. Sure. I'll let you say that. You were the glue. <laughs> I'll let you, I'll let you, you were say the glue. That. Um, and so identity forms naturally, especially yeah. over a period of time. And so one of the things I touched on in that article, which there might be people listening to this, that this has zero relevance to you because you don't have identity established in something. And that's not even, that's not a bad thing. Um, I would say that's almost a great thing for you because you don't have to deal with this part of it. But, you know, when you're kind of like the guy for the brand, like, oh, that's the dude that does this. That's the dude that does that. Part of identity comes with value right? Like self value, self worth. You know, one of the thoughts going through my head is like, okay, if I quit and I jump ship, am I still going to have the same value with people if I'm not providing the same things to them? I can't hook you up with the hat anymore. I can't hook you up with this particular experience anymore. I don't associate with these particular things anymore. How many people really cared about me for me versus cared about me for what I did, right? And Maybe that was or was not a relevant thought, but it was something that I was actually feeling and definitely like an apprehensive thing that was part of preventing me from doing it sooner. Right. You know, if, if I could have gone back in time, you know, I've said this kind of in private conversation, but, you know, I had people for that I really looked up to 
for probably like five years prior to me, you know, m- jumping ship. Like people I'm sitting at, you know, lunch tables at in LA and their phone rings and it's Elon Musk calling them, you know, people that like I look at and I go, man, I want to be like that dude, right? He's killing it. Like you think I'm killing it? That dude's killing it. Right. And, uh, those types of people five years prior that were like, dude, you need to go do your own thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And you hear those outside encouragements, those outside perspectives, but when you're in the bubble, right. And you're in your own world, it's tough to see it, you know, from, from there. And it's not that I didn't believe them, right. I knew what I did. I knew what I was capable of. Um, but there's also like some comfort that you can find in being uncomfortable, right. It's just like, there's a little bit of a safety net. Hey, even though I'm uncomfortable right now, I know I get this check and I at least can sustain the life I have right now. And I know I'm not going to take any steps backwards potentially, right? I don't want to take any steps backwards. Um, you know, so going back to the identity thing, um, and the self-worth it's, I had to get really comfortable. It took me about a year. Once I, once I knew I was going to be, you know, making the move and I kind of, in my mind was like, all right, I'm going to start on this path. One of the first things was I had to get comfortable with just the idea of not even being there anymore and go, it's going to be okay if I'm not there. Right. I I'm if people don't like me anymore because I'm not there. I don't have the same value to them. Cool. I'll find uh, I'll, I'll bring value in new situations. Right. Um, and then, you know, the fear of the unknown, big one. Right. Fear of the unknown can be a few things. One of those was the financial fear of the unknown. Right. Even if you're getting a check that is a measly check, it's still a kind of a guarantee, which, you know, I, I've thought about that so many times now. People always talk about the guarantee of the W-2. You get fired tomorrow. 100%. So there isn't really, it's it's this idea that there's a guarantee. And really what that comes down to is like, you know that, you know, you could miss work one day or you could send it in a couple days that month and not really put in the same effort that you did all the other days and you're still going to get the check, right? Like that's really what that is. But, uh, you know, the paid time off, all that stuff. But Jim Carrey's got a famous bit on like taking the safe job. Have, yeah. you, have you seen it I or haven't, whatever? No. So basically like he's talking at this university and and his, I think his dad or whatever, you know, really wanted to play it. Like he wanted to do, I think what, what Jim did mm. like his whole life, but then wound up playing it safe and taking like an accounting job. And he went like eight or 10 years or so, some, some time frame into the job and then got fired. And he's like, you can do everything right and take the safe bet and still yeah. like it not be safe and guaranteed in the long run. Right. And so like, why not, instead of going after plan B, stick with plan A yeah. the whole time? Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I mean, uh, you know, the fear of the unknown when it came to the financial component was like back to the, I don't want to take any steps back. I've already built my life up to this certain point. If I jump ship. I'm I'm doing the point of no return, right? I'm jumping off the edge and there's no coming back, right? Well, if it doesn't work out, then what, what happens? Am am I, am I going to be homeless? (laughs) Like crazy thoughts like that, right? Which I know, like I've got great family, like friends, like that would never happen. But I, I, I did love the, where I was in terms of like, I always felt like I was flying high, flying at a high level. The, the, different people I got to interact with, the organizations, like, you know, the professional athletes, the sports teams, the different positions that I got to be in, right? Um, I don't want to stop doing that. I don't want to stop operating at that level. I only want to keep going there or higher, right? So, um, you know, I had probably four or five people outside of just some immediate family, like respected, you know, colleagues or people in the industry, uh, who I felt like I could talk with, you know, one of the problems for me working up to the the day of actually leaving and even going through any of that process was I'm connected to so many people. I know so many people. I got to be really careful with who I share, what I'm attempting to do my game plan exit strategy with, because I didn't want to get pushed off the edge, right? I didn't want word to come back, uh, and then get pushed off the edge. I wanted to jump. Right. Because getting pushed means I'm not in control of the situation. Me jumping is like, you know, you're you're jumping out of the plane. Right. Like, okay, I'm making this decision and I'm trusting that the parachute's going to deploy. But I feel pretty good about the parachute deploying. That's why I'm jumping. Right. So um, I had these four or five people that I really respected. You know, some of those 
LA lunch table folks and people I aspired to be like that really not only were just great for me to be able to talk with and strategize with, but the encouragement, right? The encouragement and the motivation of like, hey man, just so you know, this is the type of money that you can get. This is, from what I've seen you do, this is what you can expect to happen. I have no doubts in you. Like those people that just build you up, but I'm also trusting and believing in them because of how credible they are, right? It's not just like, you know, your homie that's just like, oh dude, you got this, <laughs> you know, like, which I had that too, right? But, you know, I guess it's maybe take this back to the idea of seeking counsel, right? When you are seeking counsel, um, you could think that from a, a legal perspective or, or just advice, right? Uh, you want to go get that counsel from people who have seen, done, uh, learned, know more than you, right? Because it's like the idea, and I don't want to say you can't get good advice from people who haven't done as much as you. I think there's perspectives that you can gain from everybody, right? But if I'm taking advice from someone, man, I want that person to, I want to have confidence in that advice, especially if I'm going to apply it to myself. So having these four or five people, um, you know, shout out to my guy, Jason. Uh, he was one of them, uh, you know, Jason Hines. Uh, he was just a great guy to have in my ear. And uh, respecting the the knowledge base of these people and and hearing it over and over again, like, dude, you're good. Like, just go do it. So uh, it was kind of probably like all over the place in terms of like really that article and yeah. anybody wants to go dive in, I can send you the link and you can go check it out. But um, there, there's probably a couple more things in there, but really like the fear of the unknown, loss of identity, uh, you know, and then just taking that leap of faith. The, the other thing too, being prepared. Like there's people that jump ship without any preparation. They're like, oh, I'm gonna figure it out. That's not me. I don't wanna figure it out. I wanna have practiced the jump a couple times, you know, before I go. So um, I think it's really important if you wanna have like a quote unquote smooth transition, uh, you really gotta set yourself up for success. There's things that you can't, you know, uh, that you can't prepare for, that are just gonna happen in real time that you have to react to, right? But there's a lot you can do on the front end to set yourself up to where when you do jump, there's a high likelihood that you're landing safely, you know? Dude, it's so good. There's so much to unpack there. Um, the the reason why I wanted to dive into this article Am I talking too much? Not at all, okay. bro. Like you, <laughs> this is making my job super easy. You just answered like six questions okay. in one. But nah, for real, the, the, the reason why I wanted to dive into this is because I get a lot of people, especially young people coming up to me who want to be a full-time mm -hmm. filmmaker, but it's a terrifying, you know, arena to jump into. Um, when you don't feel prepared and I've had a lot of people come up to me, like either they're fresh out of college, either they're working a job and they're, they're doing the video on the sides, but they can only take Saturday and Sunday gigs. And it's yeah. like, you know, there's so much unknown, uh, about like making, making the jump. Right. right. Um, and you were someone who had like the safe cushy job and, and still made the jump. And so I wanted to hear mm. and dive into like you know, for the filmmaker on the other end of this, or or not even um, if they haven't gone full time yet, there's a lot of people that are full time, but they're doing freelance work that they don't want to be doing, right? But right. they haven't made the jump to to doing the the thing that they want to do. They're stuck here when they want to climb to this point. What did you do to really, or like, what advice would you give to the other person on the other end of this that wants to make the jump into the new arena, the next level, the full time filmmaker, whatever it is? Um, but there's reservation because of you know all of the unknowns. Well, I mean, if I can kind of adjust that question a little bit, if it's cool, you said something when people were asking you for advice. You know, oh well, I can only do gigs on Saturdays and Sundays, right? Well, I think that right there, what you just said, is a huge component and a huge mental roadblock for a lot of people, and it's the excuse of I don't have the time, and I'm calling it an excuse because it's an excuse. It's not to sound harsh. Love you guys, um, but like I was having this conversation with my cousin yesterday. He's young, marketing mind, in the culture, you know, kind of you know, kid. And he's already starting like a marketing company. 
and he's in college, right? And and this would apply to anybody what that says like, you know, it's it's hard to find the time. Well, okay, let's just say you've got your full-time job, right? Or you're you're a full-time student, whatever you are full-time that prevents you from having this time. What's the excuse for all the other people who aren't saying that? Mm. What about the people that you're following, the entrepreneur accounts, the young kid that's killing it, that you are following and watching and you quote unquote aspire to be like, what is the difference? We all got the same 24 hours, right? So if that's true, we all believe that we have the same 24 hours. The only difference is that you're making the excuse that you don't have the time. So what does that mean practically? For me, it was the setting myself up. And this goes into the setting yourself up for success in that transitional moment is, well, normally I'd wake up, you know, I'm, I'm the dude that's out at the nightclub or I'm coming back on a flight, you know, traveling all over, throwing parties, events up till two, three o'clock in the morning with the who's who and this city and that city. And I'm waking up at, I still got to be at the office at nine. You know, they gave me a little leeway, like, Hey, we get it. <laughs> like you're, you're doing stuff. And like, uh, it's tough to just, I, I still got to sleep at some point. Right. So maybe I'm coming in at like nine 30 or, you know, maybe 10, if I'm really pushing it, but I would still try to be there at nine, you know, cause there was other obligations that I had. Right. And still had to get those things done. Right. Have the time to get those things done. Um, and I don't like to be a person that makes excuses. I just like to meet expectations and exceed them. Uh, so uh, but I'm doing all that. I got my full-time job. Well, how am I going to find the time now to work on what I want to be doing? Well, I got to make it. So that means I got to wake up earlier. So maybe I'm waking up now at 5 a.m. Don't want to wake up at 5 a.m., right? But now I'm waking up at 5 a.m. And that time between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. is devoted completely to this new endeavor that I'm trying to pursue. I get home, whether it's 6 p.m., 7 p.m., whatever. Okay, if I don't have any obligations for the, the main thing right now, then that time's got to go to the new thing, right? And here, here's the deal. There's not like some set amount of hours per day or per week that you have to do, but you got to think of it from an accumulation standpoint, right? Like, okay, if that means you're able to get an extra two hours out of your day to dedicate to this thing, that's what you're able to do. If you're able to get an extra four, that's what you're able to do. Whatever that number is, over time, that adds up. But you still have to get to this certain number of hours. And it's not like a mathematical equation where you have to get to a thousand hours or whatever it is. But you will know when the preparation is over. But because you're you're at the point of being able to jump, like I'm at the edge, I can jump now. But if you don't actually put that time in, it's not happening. So like you're a full-time student, dude, wake up. Don't go to the party that night. Don't go to the game. Like uh, before class, be doing this. In between classes, be doing this. Don't do it to your detriment where you're failing your classes now or your boss is like tripping on you because you're not meeting expectations at your full-time job or it's taken away from your core responsibility. But that's one thing that bothers me. I say bothers, it's, it's it doesn't affect me. But yeah. when I hear people asking this question from an advice standpoint, or they're taught they're frustrated, it's like, dude, you have time. You're just not making it. You're and you're not dedicating yourself. You say that, and that's that's the big difference, man. A lot of people say, like, oh man, I'm so sick of my job, or I wanna, I want my this to be my main thing. It's like, well, your actions, I hear what you're saying, but your actions aren't really showing me that that's true in your heart. Cause if it was, you would have already been putting in the work, putting in the effort. You know, a buddy of mine pointed this out. You'll hear me probably say this a couple of times through the podcast, but I always talk about the time, energy, and effort that it takes. And I was saying that to a buddy of mine, he's in a band and we're outside the tour bus talking about something else. And I go, time, energy, and effort to do this or make this happen. And he goes, T. Dang, and I, and, and, that's and, but, crazy, and, 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 bro. And I go, I go, T. I go, what? He goes, no, T, time, energy, effort that's and i was just like i go man keaton shout out keaton stromberg i go keaton i wish i thought of that That i go i go i'm gonna steal that but i'll give you the credit so here's your credit keaton white Um, tea baby (laughs) white tea i love it man that's that's incredible yeah but the time energy and effort though that it requires to do that is what it requires to do that yeah right so if you're not actually willing to put that in the time the energy and the effort 
it's not going to happen. And you're just going to be talking about it forever and ever until it's just a regret that sits on the shelf that you can never get back. This is your sign. If you're watching this, take the jump. Yeah. And, the it, jump. And, and it's the jump though happens after the time, energy, and effort, yep. you know, so put the time, energy, and effort in right now, if you even want to be in the position to take the jump and take it in a way where you can have confidence in what you're about to do. I love it, dude. When you went through that season where you, you switched into the different role, you said you struggled with like the identity piece mm. of it. Something that I talk about a lot on this podcast is the identity that comes with being an artist mm -hmm. with, um, you know, whatever role you're in, um, and whatnot. How do you, how do you feel like you've approached your identity change now? And like, what's, because in all honesty, I don't, I don't actually think that it's, it's really healthy to identify, um, or have your identity wrapped up in your craft at all. Um, that's, that's kind of my personal belief. You know, I, I say I identify as a filmmaker and right. that is part of my identity, but I think a conscious, um, active thing that I try to work against is letting my identity become Joey, the director of photography, Joey, the filmmaker, like my identity for me has to almost be separate mm -hmm. from that. Um, because if your identity is as an artist in something that, you know, could one day be taken away from you, you're going to be stuck in a position where, or, or, or if you get let down tremendously, it's like, oh, well, I'm a failure. And it's like, uh, that, that's just kind of my personal like MO on it. But, um, how do you approach having your identity as, uh, you know, the creative that you are now coming from the management, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the marketing side yeah. that you were in. I mean, it's kind of funny, man. I feel like I almost don't have an identity mm. now. It's like what I was saying to you, uh, before we started is one of the most common questions I get from people is, yo, so like, what exactly is it that you do? Right? Like you go on my Instagram and I, and I remember, you know, hearing this debate a million times during like the clubhouse days, like, you know, do you think you should have personal, uh, a personal page and, you know, a brand page, like personal stuff, just where you put your family and, you know, this, that, and the other. And then you've got your business page where it's only your work and this and that. Well, I think that's probably, if we're talking modern day times, that is where a lot of that struggle for people comes with or, or comes from is because your, your identity, right? So like, there's, I, I think there's a couple words here. There's identity, there's personal brand, right? And then there's personality, mm. right? I think there's some crossover that's happened with those words uh, through just the age of social media and the idea of hearing for years and years, like, all right, well, regardless of what you do, right? Like you need to have a personal brand. That used to be a thing for like celebrities. Celebrities got to have personal brands. Athletes got to have personal brands. That's <laughs> like the dude, you know, handing you your Starbucks coffee <laughs> has to have a personal brand now, you know? And, um, but going back to that debate of like, should my social media only be business or personal? Should I separate them? Should I combine them? I think that's where I get that question a lot from. You go to my Instagram page, you're going to see everything. You're going to see a picture of me kicking it with my sister's horse. You're going to see a picture of me with, you know, some celeb, some athlete in some setting doing something crazy right? Um, you're going to see some of my production work, right? You're going to see uh, different cool experiences that I've gotten to have. Now, is it curated? 100%. Like, I think everyone's curated. Like, I want you to see the version I want you to see, but there's a lot of intention behind it. You know, I don't even have, and I haven't had this since I, you know, jumped ship, is a lot of the formal stuff that like when I'm consulting with people or just giving advice to like some person that's just about to start a business or something, I'm going to tell you, dude, you better have a business card. You better have a proper website. You better have your social media dialed. You know, for me, I don't have any of that. I, have, I haven't had it at all. I've got the domain, but the domain points to my Instagram page because I know the effect that it has. And the effect that it has is you coming up to me going, yo, dude, so like, what exactly is it that you do? I'd actually rather that question because of what you were just talking about, not having your and I did have it like that at one point, my identity tied to what I did, 
right? Um, from a business standpoint, from a, this is my job standpoint, which is what got me so wrapped up in that. It was cool to have that identity, right? Don't get me wrong. Like, oh dude, you're that guy that does this. It's like, yeah, cool. Like you recognized it. Um, but then when it came time to leave, now that's become almost my worst enemy mm -hmm. is like feeling like, uh, well, am I worth, do I have the same value to people outside of that identity? Right. Yeah. So, uh, I, I would say with personal branding, with social media, you know, sure. Keep it just your work. But if, if your whole page is just your work, say you're a photographer and it's just these epic portraits and photos and whatever it is like, Oh, that, I mean, that's how you're going to get introduced by people just by default. Oh, you're the, the dude, he's, a, he's a photographer. Well, you're more than just a photographer. There's a lot of depth beyond just like you being the photographer. I would rather someone come up and not really be able to figure it out other and, and they're wanting to know because it's so interesting looking mm -hmm. to them. Doesn't mean it can't still be interesting. Can't still be cool. Can't still be curated and have the look that you want it to, to look like. But you know, I, I, there's probably some people that would argue against it and say like, well, dude, you might be confusing people. It's like, well, having confused them enough to not be able to sustain, sustain business and sustain it at a, at a, at a high level for the last four years since jumping ship. Also part of that too, is like the 13 years prior to that I built up a reputation. So like, I'm not telling you don't have a business card. Don't, you know, have the website, don't have those formalities that I would preach to most people to have. I also happen to be in a position where over the prior 13 years, I was able to build up a reputation, a network of people mm -hmm. that trust me, know what I do through the experiences with me. And then once they knew I was independent, we're like, Hey, we want to keep working with yeah. you. And I think that's kind of what makes your situation a little bit more unique yeah, for sure. than like that needs to be acknowledged person. Yeah. It needs to be acknowledged. There's, that, it's a unique component. Yeah. Because you had like one of the craziest like Dallas networks that uh, I had ever heard of, um, especially, you know, circa that area era that you jumped sure that you, you were able to take those people that you had built relationships with and convert them into clients, yeah. uh, you know, in the creative space once you actually left. And so, right. Or they're sending me business, right. Right. I might, might not even be doing work with them. It's like, oh, you should go talk to this guy, yeah. you know? And I just, to. I want to go back just to really emphasize the relationship component. I know we've touched on it, but I think that's one of the most valuable things anybody, I don't care what business you're in, what industry you're in, it's one of the most valuable things you can do. I prided myself off of being able to hop on a plane, go to a city, and when I land, not have any plans, pick up the phone, and the entire time I'm there, I've got stuff to do because I know people. Every time I go to a new place, I am trying to walk out of there with phone numbers, not just the numbers, some social equity with the person to where when I come back, I know I can hit you up and I can make something happen. You know, you hear people say it's not what you know, it's who you know. You can know a lot of people and make nothing happen with it. It's not what you know, it's not who you know, it's who can you pick up the phone and call right now and make something happen whether that's something for business, whether that's a place to stay, a ride from the airport, something to do that night, an event to be at, like that is one of like the most important things I think probably out of this entire podcast, I would say someone could get and implement that will change their life. Mm. Like take, I'm talking change your life even on a personal level, right? Forget business, apply that exact same concept to your personal life, it, it'll change everything for you. So good, dude. If you didn't hear anything, <laughs> yeah. build relationships and build them better. Uh, man, that's so good. The The last thing that I wanted to jump into. Last thing, man. I don't want it to be over. Oh, bro. Well, I got three questions that I like <laughs> to ask each of my guests before we get you out of here. But before before we even get to those, um, one of the things that really was intriguing to me as somebody who had done the craft for a really long time. Mm. Uh, and then watched you get into the game because I was doing video before yeah. you were. You became a very serious artistic like contender within the city 
in a really short amount of time, I feel like. And well, I appreciate that compliment. <laughs> absolutely, dude. And I wouldn't say that, but you know, I, you have humble tea over here. Just you, sipping on tea. that humble tea, sipping. you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's the new product that he's marketing right now. Yeah. He just slid that right yeah. in there. Yeah. Um, but you know, what do you feel like you did that you would call a secret sauce when you were leveling up your creative craft? Um, because like you were, you've already dipped into blender and like you're doing mm. these 3d things and you know, you've been what doing video for what, four years now, like call it uh, yeah, four years. And so, uh, like it's, it's, that's not that much time to have already done the type of products that you're doing. And so I'm curious what you feel like you did that really helped, uh, you know, advance your trajectory at the rate that it did. Man, I, I think, uh, kind of going back to the a unique component is my background, right? So obviously with that company, I was in a lot of unique positions, but then through the relationship building, I was also in a lot of unique positions that had nothing to do with the company. So I've spent a lot of time in the entertainment world, uh, you know, because I'm friends with artists, DJs, right? Um, you know, some of these notable people. When I say friends, I'm in the backstage scenarios, you know, I, I've in the last probably 16, 17 years, I paid to go to one concert, <laughs> like, Dang. like one. And, and if I'm at, who was it by the way? Odessa. Oh, bro. Which that's, that's, that's pretty literally, random. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Random. Shout out. Yeah. And that was literally just to like do something nice and, you know, yeah. uh, little date night, you know, kind of thing. And shout out Odessa, man. Yeah. I'm sure if I really wanted to, it was last minute. I found out that day they were there. If I probably really wanted to work it, I could have made a phone <laughs> yeah. call or two to like make it happen. Um, but uh, I'm in, I'm on music video sets for yeah. 14, 15 years. You, I'm backstage at X Factor, at the Fox Studios. I'm at, you know, you name it, major, major productions, huge music festivals. I'm getting to see the inner workings of how the crews for these artists that manage them and the backline support and, you know, everything in between works you know music video sets i i knew it i was on two hundred thousand three hundred thousand dollar music video sets crazy before i had ever touched a video camera yeah. you know um so you basically had a, a you were immersed in yeah. the video world way before you even learned the technical side right essentially right well then even growing like i mentioned before growing up my mom is a professional photographer mm -hmm. when i'm younger at 10 years old i'm assisting her on shoots right i'm holding light meters telling her the you know what the iso needs to be i don't even know what it means i'm yeah. holding reflectors for her like you know doing just grunt work but i was still immersed in it then didn't ever you know back then i was like oh i'm never gonna do this like yeah. i would never want right. to you know hold a camera and, and do this or that and and to be honest with you even now uh it's not that i don't want to hold a camera but i love I love kind of being the composer of a situation, you know, call it producer or whatever you want to call it. But like, I like putting the A to Z together. I love being able to pick up the phone, call the different puzzle pieces. You know, like one way I describe what I do, people are like, well, hey, how come you don't have employees or this? I take the Danny Ocean approach, like Ocean's 11, Ocean's 12, Ocean's 13. I don't want the headache of having employees and managing that infrastructure. Um, what I do love the idea is like, you know, Danny Ocean, he's got this, this casino to rob. What does he do? He goes, well, I need my explosives guy. I need my, my small guy that can fit in the small spaces. I need my expert at, you know, lock picking or whatever it may be. Uh, but I love the idea of tapping into other people who are experts at what they do, right? Letting them be that for this moment. And also I'm not your end all be all. I love that you've got your own thing going on. So like if, it, if it's Blender, right, or you know 3D animation, I'm hands on in that. I'm nowhere near the level of my team of guys that I've developed over like the last couple of years that just absolutely crush it at that kind of work. But I had to get hands on enough to be able to understand it, not just so we can communicate well with each other on the team side, but on the client side, and I can build that confidence. Here's proof that you should spend this much money with me to have this 3D animation done. But but I love the idea of, hey, let's all come together. Let's assemble for this moment, for this project. You're already standing on your own two legs. You already have an incredible business of your own. 
uh, let's make this money together right now. As soon as it's over with, let's go do our own thing. You know, so I think I kind of got off on your original question for a second. Also, one thing I, I would love to touch on, and I don't know if we can like edit this into like a previous section, but back to that idea of like, what exactly do you do? Which kind of ties into the the composer ideas. Can I talk about yeah, that real quick? That, that Mavs uh, Guitar Slayer situation. 100%. So, um, and I'll let you all figure out, maybe this is just going to be me telling you how to figure it out, <laughs> you know, in real time. Uh, but the idea of when people will come up to me and say, hey, what exactly is it that you do? I know that this is a production based podcast and I live and work in the production world. I also do stuff, you know, marketing consulting that has nothing to do with production, right? Or business consulting that has nothing to do with production. Sometimes I'm doing all of that for one client, right? Um, but like a great example would be a project just did um, with the Dallas Mavericks and something simple, right? The national anthem. Uh, this is a little bit different version of it though. So uh, friends with you know Machine Gun Kelly, his band and the crew, uh, he's got this guitar player, Justin Lyons, uh, on stage persona, guitar slayer. Um, dude's one of the most talented, incredible, just rock stars, like pure rock star. You see this dude play, there's no other way to describe him, but just rock star. I think this example of this project, and I've done it with the Dallas Stars as well, um, really kind of, I guess in a simplified way, I specialize in taking something from idea to fruition, but also like conceptualizing the idea itself. So I can come up with the idea, I can pick up the phone to make the phone calls to actually connect the dots and execute it and make it happen. And then if need be, whether it's me hiring someone or I got to hold the camera myself, we'll document it at a super high level and give you the A to Z of, of the whole thing. So with him, one day I'm driving and, you know, I'm just trying to think of ways like how can we take, you know, Guitar Slayer and put him in positions where, you know, he's traveling all around the world playing with Machine Gun Kelly, Black Pink, Lil Wayne, Travis Barker, right? He is a superstar in his own rights, but he's also doing his thing on the stage with, the machine gun Kelly or the, the, the name on the, the outside of the building for the night. How can we put him in positions where he's the superstar of the night? It's his show, right? As a guitar player. So I'm driving, thinking about that. I think about that Jimi Hendrix national anthem performance. I think it was at Woodstock, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And it's one of those like iconic performances. I was like, man, he could do that. And I see in my head, him in a stadium in an arena, like literally this visual of him just shredding the national anthem. Is this boring you? Absolutely. You not. yawned right there in the middle I, of my story. I did because I did. I I woke up far too early <laughs> okay. to make it to this podcast, <laughs> yeah. but not bored at all. Okay, so <laughs> I, I, I just want to make sure, man. Uh, so I I see this vision in my head. I can literally when I say vision, I see the visual of him shredding, right? Almost like I'm looking on like a camera screen or a monitor. And uh, so first thing I did was call him right after I, I'm like, hey, dude. What do you think about this idea? Would you even consider doing something like this? He's like, yeah, that could be cool. Like I, I could I could rock that out. Next thing I do is like, okay, well, how am I going to make this happen? Well, I got to get with the, at that time, it was with the stars. We just did it with the Mavs at the Suns game uh, this past week. Um, but I hit up my contact, same formula either way, right? I hit up my contact at the stars, this awesome girl over there. Um, she, I tell her the idea. She goes, I think it's amazing. I need to connect you with Kevin. He's the head of in-game production. He's the guy that would make the decision on this and he runs the show. Like he is the head of production for in-game broadcast, everything. Um, so I, I get connected with him. Talking with him, he kind of hits me with like the roadblock of like, hey man, uh, if you can give me a demo, I'll check it out, right? Uh, but just so you know, we've had the same person doing the anthem every game for the last 15 years. Wow. We don't bring in anybody else. You can imagine if we open it up to the public, how many calls we'd be getting to do the anthem. Um, and we also like the consistency that we get. And Selena Ray, shout out to her. She's former American Idol contestant, super talented, but that's their, that's their girl that does it, right? So I'm already up against all this stuff. I end up hitting up Justin Guitar Slayer. I'm like, hey dude, I need a demo. They're on tour in Italy uh, or in Europe. They're in Italy that night. They've got sound check. I'm like, I need you to get Sam. Uh, also, shout out Sam Cahill, super talented videographer and ph photographer, um, Machine Gun Kelly's guy. 
done his documentaries, music videos. The dude is amazing. I go, I need you to get with Sam and I need the most epic demo, like at sound check, like on stage in an arena, because I want to send this demo and it'd be like no other demo that they've ever gotten before. And to set the tone and the optics of like, oh, this isn't just some random guy with a guitar that wants to do the national anthem. Long story short, we get that demo. We get that piece. I'll send it to you. You can check it out and uh, send it over to Kevin. Get an email the next day. Hey, we're interested. <laughs> you know, because it's an epic visual, right? Number one. But then we also got the benefit of like the guys behind the soundboards recording the live audio on stage in arena audio at this sound check. Um, send it to them. They're interested. We get to the point where we come in, we do it for one game. The crowd response is so epic. They're like, yo, we want you to come in for another one. So we ended up doing two with the stars. Um, but for me, that example is just a great representation of kind of what I'm capable of. There's so many different components in there. I'm not just the video guy. I'm not just the idea guy. It's everything in between from idea to fruition and how to make it all happen, execute it, pick up the phone, know the people and all of that, every single one of those components, relationships were involved, right? I could have just had the idea. I don't have the relationship with Guitar Slayer. I could have had the relationship with Guitar Slayer, don't have the relationship with the stars. I could have, uh, you know, e everywhere in between, right? So we just did that with the Mavs, rocking this tonight or shout today because of that shout out. Um, we're doing it again with them here soon, but those are, those are the types of situations that I love to be in. All my experience, marketing, production, people, everything comes into play um, in a situation like that. Bro, one of my favorite things about this podcast is that all of the different guests that we've had on the show shine a light on the different unique ways that you can actually make a sustained career as mm. a filmmaker. And I think that your story and your situation and how you've built your business is a really interesting look at how somebody can approach a freelance filmmaking career. And I know you do other like consulting stuff yeah. as well, but it's like the, <clears throat> one of the, one of the things that I think is advantageous is to just have like a wide mindset in terms of how you can make money as a filmmaker mm -hmm. and how you can approach making films. A lot of people think like, oh, I'm going to be a great like camera operator or I'm going to be a great producer or a great director. And you color outside the lines oh, in yeah. terms of how you set up making a sustained creative, you know, filmmaking career. And I just think it's a really noteworthy thing to point out that like you've, you've, you've done this thing differently than most people do. And I think that that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. And so shout out to you for just providing a unique perspective on how you can be a successful filmmaker and connect dots and make things happen. And, and, you know, ultimately, you know, produce and direct like these, uh, you know, extraordinary films. So shout out to you. Thanks, man. man. Um, dude, I want to be respectful of your time. Before we get you out of here, I got three questions that we like to ask each of our guests before we wrap them out. My first question is, if you could go back in time, what's one thing that you would do different in your career? That specific to filmmaking. Mm. I mean, it, it kind of goes back to the jumping ship concept, right? I'd said, I wish I would have done it five years sooner. Because if I knew what I knew after jumping ship and like the quote unquote success, right? I haven't reached like where I want to be, right? But in terms of the successes that I've had, I would have done it so much sooner, right? Ignored the fear of the unknown, ignored all those things. So I guess maybe what I would say to people listening is if you have that feeling, you have that urge, take action sooner than later, right? The action is what's actually going to build your confidence, right? But the inaction is the thing that's going to have you stewing and all the things that are preventing you from moving forward in the first place. Um, so I wish it's not per specific to filmmaking, but anyone listening to this, I think could benefit from like, don't jump sooner than later, but take the action that's going to prepare you to be able to jump sooner than later. If this is truly a passion that's like burning inside of you and you know, it's where you're supposed to go. I love it, dude. So good. What is one piece of advice that you can give to filmmakers trying to grow in their craft or their business? I mean, we, I'm gonna sound like a broken record relationship building. Mm. Um, stop calling it networking. 
because you're confusing yourself. You think you're just because you're at some event, you're at some mixer, you're at some thing where other people are at. It's not networking if you're not building relationships. Like I said before, what is building relationships? Getting to know someone. That means you're getting personal with them. It's not just about what you do. It's not just about who you are. Those are identity things. It's getting to know the person. If you can do that, there's so many things that I've experienced, so many things I've been able to accomplish, whether it's product placement, where normally it would have cost money. There would have been some barrier to entry, but because I had the relationship, the barrier to entry was gone, removed, right? Um, the money was not needed to be spent. Like, oh, hey, we just got you. Get in more positions where people are saying, oh, I just got you. That'll be a great thing. And you're going to love saving money on your budget because it's not always a money saving situation. Maybe it's a positioning situation. Someone's going to put you in a position because of that or save you money because of that or whatever it may be. But put yourself in a position where people want to go out of their way for you. Mm, that's so good, man. Uh, I love like throwing the idea of the word networking out and just say, I'm going to build relationships yeah. instead of I'm going to network at this event. Right. It's like a different mind frame. Yeah. Um, you know, cause it's almost like a le it, networking is more of a semi passive like mindset. Yeah. And I love the idea of just saying, I'm going to build relationships at this event. Like one way I say it to people is I want to walk into the room and when I walk out, I want to be best friends with everybody in that room. It's so good. Like if you can think from that, like how do you become someone's best friend, apply that, treat them like you're there's someone you really want to kick it with and you know magic will happen i love it man uh, before we jump off of the idea of building relationships if somebody's got somebody that they want to build a relationship with that is like outside of the reach of their current sphere mm -hmm. you know a lot of times it's like i want to work with this director mm -hmm. i want to work with this dp or i want to you know get to this person uh, who I don't currently have a relationship with. What do you what, like? What's your like secret ninja tactic to building a relationship with someone outside of your sphere? You got to put yourself inside their sphere. You got to like, you know, you want to correlate it to dating, right? You know, you want to go, you want to, you got this person in mind. Like if it's a girl that wants to meet a doctor, meet a lawyer, right? Well, if you just go hang out at dive bars or you just go hang out at like these like you know nothing wrong with it like lower end like you know not as high priced restaurants you're not going to the fancy steakhouse you're not going to like the luxury space where the doctor or the lawyer's hanging out good luck meeting them probably not going to happen right so figure out where those people exist you got to peep game like you can't just be sitting there hoping it's going to happen you got to make some chess moves you got to strategically place yourself where these people are going to be. Also, don't hesitate to reach out. Dude, the success that I've had from just blindly reaching out to people. I mean, the whole way I connected with Soldier Boy, Avicii, literally off of DMs that there's no chance these people are ever going to see these, right? Um, waking up to responses the next day, being directly connected with them, right? Um, some people will be like, like, Put all your effort into connecting with the person. It's not going to happen on a hope and a wish. It's going to happen on you taking the action. If they're outside your sphere, figure out where they hang out. Figure out they, they do online seminars. They're doing online webinars. Maybe that's your way to actually connect with them. Like maybe you got to pay to play a little bit just to get in the room with somebody. Like uh, I don't think anything's off the table. I think there's a lot of people, whether it's pride, ego, um, or just laziness that prevents them from connecting with people. It's like, I have no problem, you know, or, you know, you know, someone that knows that person, mm -hmm. reach out to them, right? Make yourself someone that other people want to connect other people to you. Like where it's like, oh yeah, I would love to. I mean, I, I use that all the time. I never have a problem with people connecting me with other people. It's like, they know me and my reputation. Oh yeah, you should definitely know this guy. I would love to make that connection for you. Yeah, you know. So I know that's several different things, but nothing's off the table. The only thing that's going to happen from you not taking that approach is you not getting to the person that you want to get to. So good, uh, pff, Mike. Drop dog. That was great, uh, dude. Last question for you, and then we'll get you out of here, bro. Who is one filmmaker that has inspired you or your work? Man. 
I should have been prepared for this question. <laughs> I knew you guys sent uh, some of this over and I looked at it. So straight up, that's kind of something that I struggle with. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're talking about like the creative style and and not having a ton of time in the game and having like developed some of that. Um, I couldn't tell you. Like I've just, it's almost like it's just like a collective of information stored in my brain. I'm not sitting there, you know, checking out Peter McKinnon stuff every day or this person or that person, like the YouTube, you know, community. I just see cool stuff from time to time. And I'm like, oh, that's dope. Like, that'd be cool to kind of like approach a situation like that. But like straight up, man, and I know this is not what people are going to want to hear. And there's professionals watching this. They're going to be like, oh, that dude is like, doesn't know what he's talking about. But there's a lot of times I go into situations, not unprepared for like the shoot, but there's times where I go in and I'm just kind of figuring it out in real time. Like where I'm like, I know the idea of what I'm trying to, you know, I'll have like a storyboard or I'll have, you know, some, some guidelines, but um, I know what kind of lighting I'm going to bring. I'm going to have a fog machine there. I'm going to, you know, have some blue flares with this lens filter, you know, going yeah. on some stuff like that. And like some particular shots that I for sure want to get that are on a shot list. But there's also like a bit of freestyling in the moment, creative decision in the moment. And it's, it's not me sitting there referencing some person, like even on film watching, man, like I haven't been in a movie theater in probably like 12 years. Wow. Like that's crazy. Straight up. Like. I haven't, you know, I'm a documentary guy. I love watching documentaries, but that's a whole different style of yeah. shooting, you know? So, um, so give me one favorite movie and one favorite documentary. Dude, I, I straight up, man. I can't even do that. You don't like, even have a favorite movie. I, I'm going to go back to like my childhood. It's going to be like, <laughs> it's going to be like a hook, you know, or like the Santa Claus with Tim Allen. Like I'll still watch that and love that today, <laughs> but there's, and, and oh I, so gosh. I know I'm sorry for all you people out there no, that I have love the, that. the best answer to this question, <laughs> but I'm keeping it real with you. It's you just not it how, look. yeah, it's, it's just not it, how dude. I, how I, even, you know, even like working in the sports world <laughs> or with professional athletes, I get that question all the time. Oh, do you, you love this team or that team? Yeah, Dude, I don't know who's playing half the time. Like, I just know that there's tickets at will call and a pass waiting for me. And then, <laughs> I love being at the game. I oh, love the I love environment, it, but I could care less about the details. Of course, I know who Luca is. Of course, I know who like yep. Dirk is, right? Or some of these big names, but it's it's not about that yeah. for me. It's like, I'm just peeping game, but I don't really care about who's in the blank. You know, and it's not, I don't care about them. It's just my mind isn't like, yeah. tripping on that stuff. <clears throat> so I know it's probably not what y'all want to hear. No, but. honestly, again, I, I love perspective, right? Yeah. Like at the end of the day, like you don't have to have a, a favorite filmmaker that you idolize, yeah. you know, like to to justify you as a filmmaker. Uh, like I've had multiple people, I'm pretty sure on the show, just be like, I don't, I don't really know. Like, or I've gotten too many that like, they're all just my collective experience right. of the movies that I've watched. I'm just stoked that you said Hook as your favorite oh, yeah. movie. Dude, Hook, man. dude, shout out to Hook. Bro. Core memories right there, man. Dude, I'm pretty sure there was like a really, really traumatizing scene in that movie for me as a kid. But uh, it's um, the, your parents put you to sleep to shut you up. Probably, that <laughs> probably that one. I heard that one. I was like, is that why y'all did Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing though. Man, dude, I just love your perspective. I love, I love the way that you've structured your business and the 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 unique way that you've approached filmmaking um and so i just got to give you your flowers you know right now because i think that that's a that's something that anyone listening can can uh just like archive and be like man when i'm in this situation i can approach it like this yeah well Um, dude i mean i appreciate that thank you but uh i think it is appropriate to say the same thing to you in the sense that you know i don't know how much you've shared with your audience but when I met Joey when he's 15, he's this punk skateboard kid, right? Like an awesome kid, awesome guy. But to see you go from that, I could have never imagined. And it's not a slight at you, but just thinking of you in that context, right? You and little DeAndre, right? Shout out DeAndre. Shout out DeAndre. Thinking of you in that context and your mindset at the time, just what your every day was. And then seeing you, I remember, did you go to UNT? Yeah. Yeah. So like seeing you, I remember you coming up to the office one day, hair slicked back. I'm like, yo, who is this kid? And uh, like full transformation. But I think it's a testament to people that, you know, you were not in this at all. Mm-hmm. Like not at all. at all. No, Like so far away from it that to now be where you're at, 
doing television productions, film productions, shooting major commercials, you know, all this, this work literally directing, you know, uh, television shows, right. Uh, borrowing my lens for it, by the way, shout out uh, to that too, man. Yeah, yeah. You got the snorkel lens, yeah, bro. Yeah. But to see that transformation, I think that is also something people should be aware of mm. because where you're at right now does not dictate where you're going to be. Hundred percent. But it's it's again back to what we talked about, the action, right? Had you not taken the action, you know, I'll, I'll say this one last thing. I think this is a good little nugget. My dad, I was going through a tough time one time, and he's he said this to me, and it applies, I think, to a bunch of different situations. But he, when I was in that moment, he was like, "Hey, look, you know, uh, uh, a ship, a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean, right? Big ship." it is much easier to correct course in the direction that you need to be going or should be going in when you're already in motion, mm. when you already have momentum, right? Pushing in a direction, right? Even if it's not perfectly at the bullseye, right? Um, than it is if that ship is docked at, you know, uh, with the anchor down or, or just sitting still and trying to get moving. That is so much harder because you need so much more energy just to try to get moving than you do just a correct course when you're already moving and point the ship in the right direction, right? So I think that's for you, kind of what you did in that yeah. in that moment is like, you just started taking action. I gotta go to school, I'm gonna do that. That's gonna, I'll figure out where to go from there, right? Yeah. And just keep adjusting the nose of the ship until you're pointing yeah. in the right direction. Man, that's so good. I love the analogy of the, the cruise ship. And I think, you know, it's actually wild for me now that, you know, people know me as the filmmaker and, and they're surprised that I used to skate yeah. back in the day. <laughs> and they're like, oh, wow, you were, you were a skateboarder. Yeah. And I was like, no, I really, I really was a skateboarder, yeah. like through and through to the core, uh, you know, yeah. that was, that was who I was. Yeah. And, uh, people don't even know me for that now, unless you knew me back in the day, which is cool. But yep. yeah, that was, a, that was a fun day coming back to, uh, the office of the it made warehouse. no sense to me i was like i have no clue what's happening and like <laughs> you know it's like you ever, you ever watch uh family matters with steve urkel <laughs> yes he goes he goes in that little machine that takes him from steve urkel to stefan and he's yeah. like the super cool version like <laughs> yeah. i was like yo this is like a totally different human being right now and i love it man i love it and that's progression yeah. right that's growth Thank um, you, and that's what everybody should be like striving for so i guess it's just a reminder like where you're at right now is not where you have to be it doesn't determine your future but your action does so sick dude i love it bro man uh dude thank you so much for coming on the podcast bro it, it's insane that we've even just been homies for 13 years but yeah. man it's cool to see all that you've done and that you're continuing to do in the filmmaking space and in the creative space and just everything with the career bro uh nothing but love man for real thanks so, man love you too buddy yeah likewise man hey for those that want to get connected with you and build a relationship with you what's the best way to get connected uh, social media, man. And really my Instagram, that's really the only thing I run. Um, white T B H F. So white, like the color T E E and then B H F stands blessed and highly favored. Blessed easy, and highly favored, easy way to remember that white T B H F on Instagram, uh, hit me on the DM. You can find my email, everything like that on there. Um, I'm one of the people that if you reach out to me, I'm more than likely going to respond, yeah. you know? So I love it, dude. Well, thanks again for stopping by the podcast today, man. It's been an incredible episode. Thank you all for listening and we'll see you again on the rough cut club. Mm -hmm.